I remember growing up hearing and reading about Tyrannosaurus and that there were about 50 specimens ever found. That made each new one especially important to the library of Tyrannosaurus specimens. Now we live in a world where there are way more than 50 known specimens of the animal, but a large percentage of that list is locked away from the world behind the bars of private ownership. Regardless, new public specimens are being announced every so often, and one of those happens to have found a home, whether permanent or temporary, in the halls of the Auckland War Memorial Museum in New Zealand, and that Tyrannosaurus is named Peter. The fossils that would go on to be nicknamed Peter were found on Whitney Ranch in Neobrara County, Wyoming. This specimen was found by Dick Wills, who dug up an area of about 1,800 square feet. Mr. Wills' method was to carefully dig the area over many long, hard years, until he was 40 feet past the last bone he found. Mr. Wills used a plan called corral dig. This method is often used when there are a lot of bones in a mostly flat area. From the first bone, you face north, then you move three feet to the west and dig again to the north until you find bone again. Then you move three feet to the west and dig north until you reach bone. If you don't find a bone, you keep digging north for at least 12 feet. This describes the site's west side. You go back to the first bone's corner, move three feet east, and dig north until you reach another bone. You keep going in this way until you have surrounded the cluster. When you know how big the site is overall, you can make a detailed plan for digging it up. Mr. Wills took away more than 1,000 cubic yards of dirt to get to the bone layer where Peter's fossils were buried. This made a flat area of more than 1,800 square feet. He used fluorescent paint to make a 10 by 10 grid over the whole pad and put a number at each corner or point where two lines meet. Mr. Wills also put up small fluorescent flags with numbers on them at each corner. When he found a bone, he wrote down where each end of the bone was in relation to the two corner flags that were close by. All in all, 60 of 300 bones were found of Peter. He was promptly sold off to the highest bidder. It's important that the original fossils of Peter are not changed in any way so that they can be studied. They are on display but hard to get to because they are set into a mount, because some people care more about a display piece than the science of the fossils. For a wide range of research questions, you can use high-resolution 3D digital models of the bones instead of the real ones. There are a lot of ways to do this kind of 3D scanning. Photogrammetry, an SFM or Structure from Motion scanning method based on digital photography works best for objects that have a lot of different sizes and shapes. The scans of Peter show both the shape and color of the fossils outside in great detail and are available in standard formats used in the business world so they can be used easily and provided with the mount when it is sold, assuming the buyer actually cares about those details. Photogrammetry models are made by taking high-resolution digital pictures of an object while either the camera or the object moves between shots. Based on a small number of pixels and the amount of parallax between the images, you can figure out where the camera is in relation to the object in each image, usually in the range of 10,000 to 100,000 per image. Once the relative positions are known, depth maps are made for each image. Each pixel on the depth map shows how far away the object in the image is from the camera. From these, a simple but expensive calculation can create either a high-density point cloud of the object, which can then be meshed into a polygon surface, or a polygon model directly, depending on the software used. The next step is to figure out the color of each point on the model. 
For things like showing the model on the web, which have file size limits, the model can be made smaller and with a lower resolution. And a high resolution 2D texture can be made to make the lower resolution model look the same in color view as the high resolution version. But this version is not good for research because the size reduction takes away important surface detail. So both versions are needed for a presentation on the web and for scientific use. Since the software can't tell how big something is in an image, scale bars are needed to be added to at least some of the photos so that the model can be scaled with as little error as possible. Peter's scans make it possible to scale things from centimeters to meters with an accuracy of 0.02 millimeters or better. The new Tyrannosaurus rex fossil, named Peter, was found in Wyoming's Lance Formation, about 30 miles southwest of the town of Newcastle in Neobrara County. In the same layer as this new T-Rex, a piece of an Edmontosaurus ilium and parts of a Triceratops frill were also found. The fossils were found in mudstone, which is made up of sediments from floodplains like an oxbow lake that formed in the bend of a river that no longer flows. Pollen analysis of the mudstone can give exact information about the layers. The specimen may have come from the middle or upper part of the Lance Formation, according to estimates. The Lance Formation is made up of sandstones and mudstones from ancient rivers, peat bogs, and coastal floodplains that formed in the riverine environment of the late Cretaceous, when the inland sea had started to recede. It was made when the climate was warm and subtropical, and sediments from rivers and overbanks were dumped on flat plains. The area was between the new Rocky Mountains to the west and the sea to the east. In the north, the formation is between 600 and 750 meters thick, but in the south, it is nearly 1,000 meters thick. The K-Pig boundary is also kept in the Lance Formation, and it is thought to be 66.8 million years old. The quarry map shows how the bones and other parts of the skeleton were found in their original places in the ground. The way they are placed on the map shows that, even though they were not directly connected, most of the bones were clearly part of the same individual and clustered together. The parts of the back legs were near the ischium and the pubis. The left ilium was far away from the ischium and pubis on the western side of the bone bed. The right femur was almost whole, but it was broken up. Smaller pieces of crushed bone were still in place in the matrix of the bone's medullary cavity, but parts of the femur were broken into several pieces and were found separated from the femoral head and out of place. The right tibia was found to be whole, but the astragalus and right metatarsal 4 had broken away from it. Both of these bones were found nearby. The left femur and tibia were broken up and showed signs that the bones had been altered. Flooding may have washed sediment on top of the bones, but because the bones of the left femur are so close together, it is unlikely that the body was moved very far. Those pieces would have been lost or gotten even farther apart if the specimen hadn't still been held together by skin and soft tissues. The bone bed in the quarry is shaped like a curve that meets the edge of the outcrop to the northwest and northeast. Bone modification on the corpse reveals paleoecological and paleoenvironmental information. Tooth marks are the most noticeable and can reveal who made the marks. However, bone alteration causes and consequences should be evaluated for behavioral interpretations. To determine if bone alterations occurred before, during, or after death, the specimen's pre-burial history must be examined. The pathological ischium and femur articular surfaces are extensively degraded. The ischium's proximal articulation features a 1.5 cm deep, 10 cm long groove. The distal femur lateral condyle features a round, deep depression. Future studies will use cutting-edge X-ray technologies including CT, XMT, MRI, and synchrotron imaging to diagnose this finding and examine its histology in three dimensions. Some teeth mark traces pierced the periosteum layer of the bone and injured the femur and tibia. As with fossil footprints, names have been given to those animals who make tooth traces. The animal that most likely represents a tyrannosaurid that matches the tooth marks in poor Peter is referred to as Nethicnus peralium. Peter's left femur has three Nethicnus peralium teeth marks, 20 millimeters apart and 40 millimeters long. 
Peter's left tibial shaft exhibits an elongated, shallow groove from a big single tooth strike that did not pierce the cortical bone. On the left femur and tibia, there is a negative fracture pattern, and the tibial shaft has edges that look like they were cut with a saw. There is also a large part of the tibia that looks like it is broken, and it has a tooth mark next to it. The middle part of the cortical wall of the femur was crushed into the medullary cavity. Negative flake marks on the edges of the right femur and left tibia show that these features were made by dynamic external physical forces as the long bones were stressed and then sheared before breaking. So probably not as a result of the animal's body being broken by its environment after it had died. The parallel bite marks on the left femur show that they were made by another Tyrannosaurus rex. This is clear from the size and spacing of the marks. Because these marks go across a place where a muscle attaches to bone, they can only be explained by a feeding event. This is because the depth of the tooth marks shows that the culprit was scraping tissue off bone. On the shaft, there is also a set of smaller, parallel tooth marks that do not belong to an adult T-Rex. Extreme osteophagy, or the consumption of bone, may involve chewing on the long bones even more to get to the marrow. Poor Peter was likely cannibalized. It's unusual here because Peter's bones belong to a sizable animal, and evidence of cannibalism is usually seen on younger tyrannosaurs. The only other sign that this specimen has been scavenged is a single smaller set of parallel bite marks made by an unknown animal. The tooth marks are considered damage that happened after death because there is no sign that they were healed. Unlike a lot of other Tyrannosaurus finds, this one is currently housed in a museum. So either the museum does not own Peter, or they do and are planning on taking him off exhibition for some reason. I say this because he was meant to be on display until September of 2022, but the museum was able to extend his stay until the end of 2023 to coincide with another Tyrannosaurus they are receiving and displaying, Arbra. This new exhibition may be one of the first to include two full adult Tyrannosaurus mounts based off two different specimens that both contain original material. Unfortunately, not enough skull material is known from either of the two to provide truly unique profiles, so the bones of Stan were used to fill in the gaps, hence why both specimens look alike. I'm pretty sure Peter is simply on loan to the museum by the wealthy benefactor who bought the specimen. I say this because the report on Peter that I used as the backbone resource for this video states so little about where he will end up that I have to assume that place will not be the museum's collections. Also, funny thing is that the report also states that the info shouldn't be replicated by anyone for any reason without permission. So if you see this video taken down at some point, you will know why. Why then, you might ask, did I make it so obvious? I believe in as much transparency as possible when it comes to science, even with a science like paleontology that may not have as direct a connection to our day-to-day -day lives as something like medicine. Not only should this specimen belong to humanity, rather than just one rich elitist, but so should any and all information regarding its excavation and analysis. That being said, I also want to stress that I don't think we, as scientists, should outright boycott literally any involvement of rich people or amateurs. Though I have and believe we should have a stronger, more negative bias towards the rich elites as opposed to the amateurs. Amateurs are responsible for helping out the scientists when no one else will, and for finding things in areas scientists may not be able to get to for whatever reason. So that's about it. Not much major information about Tyrannosaurus rex can be gleaned from this specimen, but it would definitely help to be able to place it as a data point in all of the analyses and matrices of future Tyrannosaurus studies. Go see him while you can, I guess. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.
Special thanks to Elephant Tier patrons Abby Smith, Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Cherry Shaw, Chris Frampton, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Ed Peretz, Isaiah Garza, Jax the Hacks, Natty Cat, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, and Extraterrestrial. As well as my top S tier Tyrannosaurus patrons Admin, Antron, Aphid Kirby, Cyber, Dana Manchester, Danny Van Heck, Henry Brennan, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Joshua Mana, Panic, Radio 404, Robert Kessler, Ruben Zachariah, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, and The Dogman.